In this chapter, we're covering the topic of equity, which is basically when we have stockholders that own part of our company. We issue stock, they become owners of the company, as opposed to borrowing money or issuing bonds to creditors. So when we issue stock, we are now talking about the corporation, the corporate form of organization. So we have an entity that's created by the law, by the statute in that particular state. That's what gives rise to the corporate form. The existence is legally separate from the owner. So the corporation is an entity all in its own. With a sole proprietorship and partnership, legally, the owners are the company. But with a corporation, it's different. The company is its own entity. And it has its own rights and privileges, just as if it was a person. The ownership can be either privately held, which means that we just have a handful of people that own it. The stock can't be bought by anybody off the street. It's not on the public exchange. If it's publicly held, however, anybody that has the money can go buy shares of that stock and become an owner of that company, part owner. Some of the advantages are the fact that it's a separate legal entity. It has its own rights and such, and it can contract, enter into contracts on its own, as opposed to an individual having to enter into a contract based on their own uh, legal rights. Limited liability of stockholders. So that separate legal entity gives rise to a limited liability for stockholders. What this means is that if the company sue or if uh, someone sues the company, they have, if they win the lawsuit, they have the rights to whatever amount of assets they were entitled to through that lawsuit of the company itself. They can't go after the individual owners of the company. That would have to be a separate lawsuit altogether suing that individual, and they'd have to show that that individual was responsible for something. With a uh, sole proprietorship or partnership, if someone sues your company, they are suing you as an owner as well. It happens at, in one lawsuit. Transferable ownership rights. So that means you can easily buy and sell stock. Continuous life. The entity, the organization, the corporation can last and live longer than any individual owner. Lack of mutual agency for stockholders. What this basically means, it can work both ways. The corporation can't enter into a contract on behalf of the stockholder, and the stockholder can't into in enter into a contract on behalf of the corporation. Only the owners them or I'm sorry, the, only the officers themselves, the agents of that corporation can enter into contracts on behalf of the corporation. Ease of capital accumulation. This just means that it's a very or it's a relatively easy way to get a lot of cash right away if if you have investors that are willing to buy stock, become part owners, you can get cash a lot easier than some other forms. One of the disadvantages is that you have governmental regulations. So once you issue stock, now you have to follow all the rules of the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, and you're also going to be taxed separately as a corporation. They have a separate set of tax rules that need to be followed. And furthermore, when you pay dividends to your owners, they then have to pay tax on the dividends. So you pay tax as a corporation on the income, and then if you decide to distribute it out to the owners, they again pay tax on that same income that's now been distributed to them. It's often referred to as double taxation. So the hierarchy of control in a corporation, it might seem a little bit different than you would expect. It's not the board of directors or the officers at the top, it's the stockholders. They own the company. Now generally any individual stockholder won't have a whole lot of control themselves, but if they become a majority owner or even a, just a large percentage owner, then they have more control. They elect the board of directors who then oversee the company. They hire the president, the vice president, all the officers, CFO, CEO, and then they hire the managers, they hire the employees. So that's kind of how the hierarchy works. And again, this is just another illustration of that. So now the stockholders have certain rights. Becoming an owner gives you rights to that corporation. You get the right to vote at stockholders' meetings. You have the right to sell your stock if you'd like. You have the right to purchase additional shares of stock as they're issued. 
you have the right to receive dividends if any are declared. That's a key thing there. You don't have a right to say, hey, I want X number of dividends. You have to wait until they're declared by the board of directors, and then if they are declared, you have the right to receive dividends in share in a percentage of your ownership. So uh, if you own 10% of all the common stock that's out there, you should get 10% of any of those dividends. The other thing, if the company does decide to go out of business, if they liquidate, then you get a share equally in any assets remaining after the liabilities are paid off. They get the, the creditors get their money first, and then anything that's left gets paid out to the owners based on their percentage of ownership. So this is just an example of a stock certificate. Nowadays, you generally won't get a physical paper stock certificate. Instead, a lot of this is handled electronically. It's uh, controlled through records, electronic records. They know what shares you own. Some companies still allow you to request a paper copy if you'd like, but most of it's done electronically. So we have some terms we need to look at here. Here's an excerpt of the balance sheet showing you the common stock section of the stockholder's equity. You have common stock. It says par value one cent. Authorized 250 million shares. That tells you the maximum number of shares this company can issue without having to revise the articles of incorporation, the charter and such. Then that shows how many shares were issued. Out of that 250 million, they issued about 92.5 million in 2008 and a little over 111 million in 2007. Now, this particular dollar value amount is basically the number of shares times this one cent par value. That is not the price they issued the stock at. It's not a penny stock. That's a par value for this stock. We'll talk more about that in a bit. Par value, as it's saying here, is it's an arbitrary amount. Some states require it, either a par value or a stated value. Other states don't. That doesn't match up with the market price. It'd be very unusual for it to match up to the market price. That par value is generally a round number like a penny, 10 cents, maybe a dollar, generally a pretty low number. And the price, market price is going to be considerably higher. So we'll talk about three classes, par value, no par value, and then stated value. For our intents and purposes, par value and stated value are pretty much the same thing, just different terms they're using. No par value is another name for that would be no stated value. It means we don't have to worry about that penny. We're going to record the whole market price in common stock. So let's take a look at par value stock. On September 1st, this company issued 100,000 shares of $2 par value stock for $25 per share. So we're going to record it. First, we're going to record the cash that was received with a debit, obviously. We're receiving cash. Then number two, we're going to credit the common stock account for the number of shares issued times the par value per share, in this case $2. What's left, that additional $23, has to go to paid in capital in excess of par value for common stock. So we debit cash for the full 2.5 million, 100,000 shares times $25. We credit common stock for 100,000 shares times $2 par value, so 200,000, and then the remaining 2.3 million goes to paid in capital in excess of par. It's still a capital account, we're just separating it out. And here's how it would be reported on the balance sheet if this company had par value stock. It's still going to go in the stockholders equity section, it's just going to be another line they add in there. And of course, you'd have retained earnings. That gives you your total stockholders' equity. So now, let's take a look at the same example, except instead of selling it for $2.5 million cash, they're selling this stock for $2.5 million in land. So this owner has land that this company wants, and they're going to invest that land in the company to buy stock. We're going to find that it's exactly the same except that we're debiting land instead of cash. So we take the value of the land, that, that's what we debit, we credit common stock for just the par value, and then anything that's left is going into paid in capital in excess of par. 
Let's talk about cash dividends. So when the company has owners, they have stockholders, those stockholders generally expect to receive a return on their investment. One of the returns on, those, on that investment is simply that when they sell the stock years down the road, hopefully it'll be worth more. They'll get more money back. The other return is that throughout the life of this company, you expect to receive some of that net income that the company earned. The company distributes net income in the form of dividends. And they're, what they're really doing, we know that net, incomes go, net income goes into retained earnings, and then the retained earnings is being distributed out to the owners in the form of a cash dividend. So for that to happen, to pay a cash dividend, the company first of all has enough money in retained earnings. They have to have the money there. They have to have accumulated all that net income through retained earnings before they can pay that net income out. Second of all, if it's a cash dividend, you have to have cash to pay it. That just makes sense. You can go borrow the cash, but somehow you have to have the cash. You can't bounce a check to pay a dividend. That's kind of what we're saying there. By the way, you see here that we have common and preferred stock. Uh, common stock, you can see a high percentage of companies. That's where 75% of the dividends go. 22% go to preferred stock. And that leads us into this next slide. What is preferred stock? As you can see, the term preferred means it has preferences or priority over common stock for certain reasons, for certain uh, purposes. The preferred stock gets a preference as far as dividend distributions, so they'll get their dividend first before any of the other common shareholders do. And then if the assets, if the company's liquidated, goes out of business, they get their assets first before the common stockholders do, but they still have to wait for all the creditors to be paid. So this is kind of halfway between the creditor and the common stockholder. Usually with a preferred stock, you're going to have a stated dividend rate. So it ends up looking similar to a bond. It's a, let's say, 7% preferred stock. That means that if dividends are declared, you get 7% of your par value. That's what, bond, or that's what dividend you get. Still not interest, it's not, not interest expense, but it looks a little bit more like it than common stock does. Common stock, generally, they're going to give you a dollar amount. They're going to say, we're going to pay a $5 per share dividend this year. Preferred stock, they're going to say, we're paying 7% dividend this year. Now, again, it, they're not guaranteed that money. They have to wait until the dividend is declared. So that's the other big difference between a preferred stock dividend and a bond interest payment. It's not locked in. Normally, preferred stock is not going to have voting rights. That's one of the big benefits of, be, of being a common stockholder. And here you see that 73% of 73% of corporations do not have preferred stock. 27 do. Some other preferences, in, as uh, far as those dividends go, we'll talk about cumulative versus non-cumulative. So again, as I said, there's no guarantee that even a preferred stockholder will ever receive a dividend, but if a dividend is paid that year, if it's declared that year, preferred stockholders will get theirs, whatever's owed to them, before any common shareholders get their dividends. That may mean that common shareholders don't get anything. It may also mean that preferred shareholders get something, but not all of the money they're entitled to based on that percentage. So let's take a look at what happens if the preferred shareholder doesn't get all of their dividend in a particular period. What happens in the next period? Do they get all that money caught back up, or are they just out of it for good and they have to wait till the next period to see if maybe they'll get some of that dividend? Cumulative or non-cumulative tells us what happens to those dividends in arrears that they did not get paid from a prior period. If it's cumulative, what that basically means is that even though we didn't pay it that last year because we didn't declare a dividend, we're still keeping track of what we would have paid you and we'll try to catch you up, basically, is what's going on here. So that amount is due to the preferred stockholders before any dividends can be paid on the common stock. It still doesn't guarantee that the preferred stockholders will get that. You may go years and years and years and you have this huge dividend in arrear amount, but it just never gets declared, so it never gets paid. But what that means is the common shareholders won't get anything either. 
Non-cumulative means that if you don't get it that year, you're out of luck. Next year, you'll see, maybe you'll get your full amount for just that year, just that current year, but you will never get anything that wasn't paid in the prior year. Most preferred stock is cumulative, so that gives you this big benefit. If you don't get paid last year, maybe you'll get paid for that amount. Maybe they'll catch you up in the next year. So here's an example of the uh, stockholders equity section of the balance sheet. We have common stock, all the numbers we need there. We have preferred stock. Now notice it gives you a percentage, 9% in this case. So we know that our dividends are going to be paid based on 9% times $100. That's how much each preferred stockholder is entitled to as far as a dividend, if a dividend is ever declared. So here it's saying the board of directors did not declare or pay dividends in 2007, but in 2008 they did declare and pay cash dividends of $42,000. So let's take a look at both situations. If the preferred stock is non-cumulative, that means 2007 nobody got anything. 2008, we're going to calculate that year's preferred dividend first, which again it's going to be 9% of $100. So $9,000, uh, and we have to multiply it by 1,000 shares too, because we had 1,000 shares out there. So 9% times 100 times 1,000 gives us $9,000. That's the preferred dividend. They don't get anything from 2007, it's gone. What's left out of that uh, $42,000 dividend all goes to common shareholders. They get all that extra money, which could be good. If preferred stock is cumulative, again, 2007, nothing was paid, so we're just, we can't force a payment that year. However, in 2008, when payment was made, we're first going to catch them up from 2007, which was 9000 Then we're going to pay them their 2008 dividends. And by the way, they, I'm talking about preferred. So another 9000 And then whatever's left goes to the common stockholders. So... Preferred stockholders get all their money from the past, and common stockholders get whatever's left. Another preference could be participating versus non-participating. So let's go back here and take a look at something. In both of these scenarios, the common stockholders got a lot of extra money. The preferred stockholders got, in this case, 9000 in this case, 18000 Common stockholders got a whole lot of extra money. So it could be good to be a common stockholder. You may have risk that you'll never get a dividend because the preferred stockholders barely get their dividends every year. Or you may have a great year where you get all that extra money. Participating and non-participating tells us what happens to all that excess money. If the company is non-participating, that's basically what we were looking at in the last example. The preferred dividends, they're only going to get that 9%. That's it. It doesn't matter if there's a million dollars extra dividends, they're all going to common stock, whatever's left. If it's participating, however, what happens here is the preferred stockholders get their stated amount, the common stockholders get an amount equal to that, and then whatever's left gets shared amongst the two. So with participating, you kind of have the best of both worlds. Not only do you get your dividends first, you get a share in on any excess dividends. Most stock, however, is non-participating. That's one of the reasons, you know, even common stockholders are willing to accept the risk that they may not get a dividend in a particular year, but they, they want the upside potential of possibly getting a lot of dividends when you have a good year. So reasons for issuing preferred stock. Why would the company even do that in the first place? Why not just issue common stock like normal? The reason, one of the reasons is they may want to raise capital without sacrificing control. By control, we're talking about voting rights here. Preferred stock generally does not get a vote. To boost the return earned by common stockholders through financial leverage. This goes back to the dividend. Even though that 9% rate we were talking about isn't an interest rate, it looks very similar to it. And if it's not participating, it acts as a cap. So it basically says, we're getting money in our company through preferred stock. We're only, at most, going to pay them 9% in any given year. Let's say the company is able to use that money and generate a 20% return. 
all that excess money goes through goes to common stockholders through the dividends. So we're right back to financial leverage. It's positive financial leverage. We basically borrow at a lower rate. We're using money at a lower rate of financing, and we generate a higher return with that low rate money. So cash dividends. Uh, most investors for most companies expect that dividend on a regular basis. Not all companies issue dividends, and that doesn't always upset the stockholders. Basically, you want to take a look at the company and find out what are they doing with all that retained earnings. Are they using it to expand and to grow? Do they have potential? If they're using that to basically internally finance their growth, the stockholders may be fine with not getting a dividend. But if the company is just sitting on money, not using it for any reason, the stockholders are pretty much going to expect a dividend. And if the board of directors doesn't declare one, the stockholders may very well vote in a new board of directors to declare one. So that's where that control kind of comes into play. Three important dates for the dividends. We have the date of declaration when the board of directors did declare it. That's when it becomes a liability, and now it is actually owed. The date of record just shows who owns this dividend or who owns this stock as of that date. Who do we need to make the payment to? And then the date of payment is when the payment is actually made, when we pay the cash. A lot of times these will be about a month apart. So the first one, the date of declaration. On January 19th, a $1 per share cash dividend is declared on 10,000 common shares outstanding. The dividend will be paid on March 19th, two months later to whoever owns the stock as of February 19th. So we have to figure out who owns it on February 19th to know who we're going to pay it to a month later. So we're going to debit retained earnings for $10,000. By the way, sometimes you might actually debit a dividends account itself. Two different ways to do it. You could debit dividends, which will ultimately be closed to retained earnings, or you could debit retained earnings straight away. In any case, it's ultimately going to come out of retained earnings. So we're debiting retained earnings to reduce it, and we're crediting common dividend payable to show that we now owe this money. We can't back out of it now. There's no entry required on the date of record. It's just an informational date. And then finally, when we make the payment on March 19th, we're going to debit common dividend payable for 10000 credit cash for 10000 and we're good to go. Now, we talked about the uh, fact that we have to have enough retained earnings to pay a dividend. So what happens if we pay a dividend, we pay our retained earnings down to zero. We use all of our retained earnings to pay off a dividend, and then the next year we have a net loss. Net losses reduce retained earnings, and in this case it would push, push us to a negative. So that's called a retained earnings deficit. It's just negative retained earnings. You don't want to get to this situation. So let's talk about stock dividends. Instead of paying a cash dividend, corporations could decide to issue a stock dividend. What that basically means is you're telling your investors, hey, instead of us paying you cash, we'll give you some more shares of stock. So at first that seems great. Hey, I'm getting another share of stock. I'm getting another investment. I didn't have to do anything for it. But here's the thing. We're not, as a company, getting any cash, getting any other assets in, so our equity side can't increase either. We can't just increase the equity side without increasing the asset side. So what this basically is, is you're taking one pie and you're dividing the pieces into smaller pieces and giving more pieces to that same stockholder. So a quick example here would be, hey, you have one share of stock, you know what, I'm going to cut that share in two, and now you have two shares of stock. Hey, it's a great deal. But in reality, the total amount they have is still the same. The total dollar value is still the same. So what generally happens when a company does this, when they issue a stock dividend, the market reacts by pushing the price of that stock down. So if you, if you issue a stock dividend where you're giving them one stock or one share for every share they currently have, your stock value is probably going to cut down to half. So their total value is going to be the same. 
So you may question why would a company do that? Why would an investor want that? There are actually some reasons. One of them is that it can be used to keep the market price on the stock affordable. So keep in mind, it's not hurting the investor at all. They still have the same total value. It's just split into more shares. We'll talk about stock dividends, stock splits. To some extent, they're very similar. Why would a company want to keep their stock low priced? The answer is that they may get more smaller investors in to spread the control out. If you have very high priced stock, you may only have a few people that are, or companies that are able to afford your stock. Therefore, the control is in the hands of just a few people. When one person wants something done, they have a lot more power than if you have a bunch of people owning just one or two shares apiece. That's one of the major reasons. Uh, can provide evidence of management's confidence that the company is doing well. Keep in mind, management often have a lot of shares of stock as well. So if they're willing to accept uh, that stock dividend, they're also owners. So that might be a good thing for the company as well, or for the other shareholders as well. So let's take a look at small versus large stock dividends. A small stock dividend is when we distributed less than or equal to 25% of the previously outstanding shares. A large stock dividend is when it's more than 25%. So in other words, if you have a share and we're only going to give you a tenth of another share, that's a 10% stock dividend. To do that, we're going to use a term called capitalizing retained earnings. What that basically means is we're moving an amount from retained earnings, we're moving it over to common stock. It's becoming part of the capital account. The value we use is going to be the market value of the shares at that point in time. We take the number of shares distributed times the market value, which is not going to be on our books anywhere. We have to look at the current market value. That becomes the entry for this stock dividend. If it's a large stock dividend, we're going to do the same thing, move it from retained earnings over to capital or common stock, but it's going to be capitalized at the par value times the number of shares, not the market value, the par value in this case. So let's take a look at how the small stock dividend would look. Here's the balance sheet, the stockholders' equity section, before the declaration of a small stock dividend. So we have $1 par value, basically 100,000 shares issued and outstanding. We have $143,000 total stockholders' equity. But notice it's broken into 108,000 paid in capital, 35,000 retained earnings. Keep that in mind. On December 31st, Quest declared a 2% stock dividend when the stock was selling for $10 per share. The stock will be distributed to stockholders on January 20th, 2009. We want to make the December 31st entry. So 2% stock dividend. It's a small dividend. It's less than 25%. So 2% times $10 per share times the 2,000, uh, that's 2,000 shares times, uh, oh wait, I'm sorry, 100,000 shares total. If you go back here, 100,000 shares issued times 2%. That means we're going to issue 2,000 new shares, and they're going to be issued at $10 per share, the market price. $20,000 is our, our amount. So what's going to happen here is we're going to debit retained earnings for $20,000. We're taking it out of retained earnings. We're capitalizing it. We're going to move it over to capital. So we're reducing retained earnings. We're going to increase capital. Now what happens here, since we're at the market price, $10 per share, remember how the common stock account only had the par value, that's all we could record, and then the rest went into paid in capital in excess of par value. The same thing is going to happen here. The only difference to this is that instead of calling it a common stock, they call it a common stock dividend distributable. It's kind of like a payable account. You haven't actually distributed it yet. When you do, then this will be in the common stock account. So don't let that term fool you. Now we take a look here, it's still a total of 143000 but notice the retained earnings has decreased, and the two capital accounts have increased. So the total capital is going to be 128 versus 108. So we're just moving equity around. Recording large stock dividends, we have that same 
Oh, no, no, in this case, it's a different setup. We have 200,000 shares authorized, but only 50,000 issued and outstanding. Take a look at our total amounts here. We're going to see them in a bit. On December 31st, 2008, Router declared a 40% stock dividend, considerably larger and 25% required, when the stock was selling for $8 per share. State law requires that large stock dividends be capitalized at the par value per share, which is what we said earlier. So what's going to happen here is we take 50,000 shares that are issued times 40% stock dividend. That tells us we're going to issue 20,000 new shares, but they're only going to be the, the dividend's only going to be counted at $1 par value, not the $8 selling price, the $1 par value. So that gives us $20,000. this case, we're debiting retained earnings for $20,000. And notice that the credit only goes to one place, common stock, and basically the dividend distributable. We don't have to worry about paid in capital in excess of par because there is no excess of par. It was issued at par, the $1 par value. Stock splits are very similar to this. The biggest difference is that we don't have a journal entry to record it. We're not actually moving money from retained earnings to capital. We're just simply reallocating the capital amongst more shares. So generally, and let's see, in this case, it's a two-for-one stock split. So the investors turn in their 100 shares of stock in exchange for 200 shares of the new stock. Look at the par value, though, and this will affect the market value as well. The par value went from $10 per share down to $5. So what basically happened is we had 100 shares times $10, $1,000 total, and we exchanged it for 200 shares times $5, $1,000. So you're still getting the same end result. It's just now you have more shares that are worth a little bit less. So the only thing difference, or the only thing different here in the stockholders' equity section will be the numbers and the dollar amount, the number of shares and the dollar amount par value. Nothing changes as far as the total dollar amounts, and we do not have an accounting entry. Now let's talk about treasury stock. Treasury stock is when a company goes out to the open market, they buy their own stock back from whoever currently owns it. Whatever investor currently owns it is wanting to sell it. Now the company has bought it back. This is an important thing to note. They can't control that price. They have to pay whatever the going price happens to be. They, You can look it up on Yahoo Finance, uh, the Wall Street Journal. You can see what the current price is. That's what the company is going to have to pay. So on May 8th, they purchased 2,000 of their own shares of stock in the open market for $8,000. In other words, $4 per share. So what we're going to do here is we're going to debit an account called Treasury Stock. In this case, Treasury Stock Common. Not, not such a big deal. Treasury Stock's the important thing. We're going to credit cash because we're paying cash. Treasury Stock is not an asset. It's not an investment. If you were buying someone else's stock, some other company's stock, that would just be a normal investment. It would be an asset. But if you're buying your own stock, your own company's stock, it's not an asset. Instead, it's a reduction in total stockholders' equity. Because now you're saying the comp or the investors no longer own this portion of our company. It's part of the company itself. So it reduces stockholders' equity on the balance sheet. It's known as a contra asset account. Or I'm sorry, a contra owner's equity account. It offsets the owner's equity. Because it's the opposite of owner's equity, it has a normal debit balance. That's why we're debiting it to increase it. There's a rule here that says when we sell that same treasury stock, we have to take it out of our treasury stock account at the same price per share that we put it in at. In this case, that's $4 per share. So now we sold 100 shares of that treasury stock. But notice we bought 2,000. Now we're only selling 100 shares. We're selling it for $4 per share, which is exactly what we bought it at. So we're debiting cash because now we're selling stock. We're getting more cash, and we're crediting that treasury stock to get rid of it, to reduce it. Nothing tricky to that one. But now let's take a look at this. If we sell treasury stock above cost, we have to, well, in this case, we sold an additional 500 shares at $8 per share when we only bought it at $4 per share. 
We're still debiting cash for four thousand eight dollars times five hundred shares, four thousand dollars. We can only credit treasury stock at the price that we paid for it per unit. So it'd be five hundred shares times four dollars per unit to take it out of treasury stock. The difference, the additional credit of two thousand has to go to paid in capital treasury stock. This is basically a uh, fund or a cushion account that you're setting up with this excess money that you got for the sale of this treasury stock. Even though it looks like a gain, it looks like, hey, you had a simple gain on sale of treasury stock, that's not what it is. You can't count it as a gain. You can't count it as revenue. If you were selling someone else's stock, your ownership of someone else's company, then you could, but you can't make a gain by selling your own stock shares of your own company. So instead we set up this paid in capital. This will help us to account for any situations where we sell the treasury stock at a lower price. Which is exactly what we have here. Now we're selling 400 more shares at 150 per share. So 400 times a buck 50 is $600. We're going to debit cash for $600 we still have to credit treasury stock at four dollars per share no matter what four hundred shares times four dollars is sixteen hundred dollars we're missing a debit we need this to balance out so we need an extra thousand dollar debit this goes even though it's kind of misaligned here this is a debit to paid in capital treasury stock for that one thousand dollars so we're basically saying we're now reducing that fund that we set up we're using some of it it's not a loss it's just we're using some of that paid in capital treasury stock. Stock options, another concept we have to deal with with stock. We're basically saying this is the right to purchase common stock at a fixed price for a certain period of time. This is often given to employees or management of a company to give them an incentive to do the right things for that company, be profitable, be productive, so that the company earns more money, which in turn should cause the market price of that company to go up. If the company is profitable, generally it's going to be in demand in the market, and the price will rise. It'll be a valuable company. So what happens here? In this example, the option purchase price was $30 per share. So we're saying, and by the way, when this option was granted, the price, the actual market price, was probably something like $15 or $20. So at that point, no one would ever want to exercise an option. You don't, you don't want to spend $30 per share to buy something that currently is only worth $15 or $20. The goal is to get those managers, those employees, to work harder and try to get uh, the company to be more productive, more profitable, so the price rises above that option purchase price. So in this case, the option price, the strike price was $30 per share. Now this person's working hard. Today, whatever day it is, they look at the market price and it's $75 per share. They may decide, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and cash in my option. What that basically means is that today, when the price of the stock is $75, they only have to pay $30 to buy it. And by the way, it's coming from the company. You can't say... You can't go to the open market and say, hey, you seller, you've got to sell it to me for 30 bucks." What happens is the company is the one that, out of their treasury stock, likely, or maybe new stock that they issue, they're going to uh, charge this employee or manager $30 per share. That employee or manager could then turn around and say, you know what, I just paid 30 bucks for something that's worth $75 per share. I, got a, I have an immediate gain. So that's kind of what's going on with stock options. And here, really, a little bit more about what I just said. It's to motivate them to focus on company performance, look at the long term, and remain with the company so you can keep having an influence on the company, keep uh, with the company as long as you need before you can exercise that stock option. The statement of retained earnings just shows how retained earnings has changed from the beginning of this period to the end of this period. So we have 875000 at the beginning, plus net income in this case of 155600 That increases it, but we're going to subtract out the dividends that were declared because they reduce retained earnings, and that tells us what our ending balance must be. 
with retained earnings, you could have some portion of that restricted, which basically means the board of directors can't use that to pay a dividend. We have legal and contractual restrictions. Uh, legal restrictions basically say a company can't buy more treasury stock than they have in retained earnings. So the, they're, they're capped out at whatever the retained earnings balance is. That's all they can buy treasury stock for. Contractual agreements might be that you can only pay dividends of a certain amount so that retained earnings never falls below a certain amount. The reason for that is that if you push retained earnings down to zero or even negative, depending on the situation, that could mean that if you liquidate that day, if you're in really bad shape and you liquidate, the owners have already got their dividends, there may not be enough money in the assets left to pay the creditors what they're owed. So if you pay too many dividends, you may basically be forcing the owners to get their money before the creditors do, which should never happen. Creditors should get paid before the owners. Appropriated retained earnings, it's kind of a restriction, but it's a voluntary restriction. They're basically saying on their statement of retained earnings, they're setting aside certain amounts of money so that investors realize that, hey, we don't expect any of those dividends. We know that they're using this to purchase a new facility, to invest in the company somehow. So don't expect that to be paid out in dividends, basically. It's just a signal to investors. Prior period adjustments, this is another topic that comes up with retained earnings. This is where a mistake was made in a prior period that affected net income somehow. We know that net income feeds into retained earnings, and then retained earnings continues to grow, or maybe if it's a bad year, it'll decrease. So if you have something that gave you too much net income last year, that means your retained earnings at the beginning of this year is higher than it should be. You have to reduce it down to the proper balance. The prior period adjustment does that. So it says, hey, we had a mistake. We had equipment that was incorrectly expensed in a prior period, so our net income was too low, we need to add that amount back in. It wasn't really a valid expense. So we're adding 72000 back in. Gives us our adjusted retained earnings. We add net income, subtract out dividends. We end up with our final balance of retained earnings. The statement of stockholders' equity shows how everything in stockholders' equity has changed. Retained earnings, that statement is just a subset of the statement of stockholders' equity. So we show how common stock has changed, both for the number of shares, the dollar amount, and then we get our total amount of changes, our total of balances for all stock, all stockholders' equity. So now for the next few slides, we'll talk about some ratios that are important to stockholders and retained earnings and such. Earnings per share basically shows us if all of the net income that period was paid out in the form of a dividend, what would we be getting? So this, in a way, it kind of shows an investor what they think they should be entitled to that year. Even if they don't get it in cash, hopefully that earnings is still helping to increase the value of the company. So basic earnings per share would be net income minus preferred dividends because common shareholders can never expect to get those preferred dividends. It's almost like it's an expense. And then we divide that by the weighted average common shares outstanding. So we want to have an earnings per share. Weighted average, by the way, it just means how long, you know, if, if all those shares of stock weren't there throughout the year, then we need to get a weighted average. For example, we start the year, we have 100 shares of stock. They last throughout the entire year. But halfway through that same year, we added another 100 shares, but they were only there for half of that year. Our, so what we do to weight those together, we take the 100 shares, the first 100 shares, times 100% of the year, the second 100 shares times half of the year, 50%, we would get 150 weighted shares outstanding. That's all we're doing there. It's weighted by the percentage of time that it was in existence. The price earnings ratio, it's market value per share, the current market value, nothing you're going to find on the financial statements, divided by the earnings per share that we just calculated. This tells us how much the stock is valued at compared with how much is being uh, earned per share that year. 
So for example, if you're paying $10 per share to buy a new share of stock, but the earnings per share is only a dollar, you might question, why would I pay 10 times as much as I'm going to be getting back in one year? There are two answers. First of all, you hope you're going to get more than just one year's worth of earnings. You hope that you get this year, next year, the year after that, at least 10 years to make your money back. Second of all, you hope that earnings per share will continue to increase, as will the market value per share. You hope that will increase as well. So you're basically saying, yes, I'm willing to pay 10 times as much as I'm going to get this year because I have some uh, expectations about what the company is going to do in the future. There's potential there. So the dividend yield, I mentioned this earlier, I basically said that when you invest in stock, you kind of expect two different returns. One of them is that your stock value will continue to increase year after year. The other is that the uh, you'll continue to get paid a dividend every six months or so. So you get some of your return along the way, some of your return will happen at the very end when you sell the stock. The dividend yield shows us what percentage of that return or what per, yeah what percent of return do we get just from dividends so we take the annual cash dividends per share divided by the current market value per share so if you were to buy a share of stock today what percentage of return do you think you'd get in dividends alone that takes us to the end of this particular chapter So again, if you do have any questions on stockholders' equity, retained earnings, dividends, uh, please feel free to let me know and I'll be glad to help out. Other than that, I thank you for your time and I will talk to you in the next session.